Thank you for taking the time to view this recorded webinar on telehealth and COVID-19. I'm Sue Cressley, a practicing general pediatrician in a four-doctor independent practice in Bucks County, PA. I am also an active member of the Academy's section on telehealth care and the section on administration and practice management, and I currently serve as chair of the Payer Advocacy Advisory Committee. Let's get started. My current conflict of interest is that I am the medical director for Office Practicum. However, this will not be discussed today, and I do not to intend to discuss any off-label use. So the why for many of us is directly in front of us. During this unprecedented pandemic, we need to find a way to meet our patients and families where they are, for the most part at home, to provide the care they need. We're going to talk today about the why, the technology, the workflow, and getting our patients and families on board. When we talk about the why, we can't safely see all sick children in our office in the current COVID epidemic. It exposes our office team. Often we don't have enough protective personal equipment and also exposes families to each other. And we need to maintain some practice income if our practices are to survive into the recovery phase. And there will likely be a surge at the end of this pandemic and we need to be there in order to provide adequate access to our patients and families. Let's talk about the technology. In general, true telehealth includes a HIPAA compliant platform that has both audio and visual components. It's important to note in this COVID crisis environment that the Office for Civil Rights waived potential penalties for HIPAA compliance. That means they will not seek penalties for people who in good faith are trying to provide virtual care to their patients using non-HIPAA secure platforms in the public domain, such as FaceTime or Google Hangouts or Skype. However, it does not mean that there are no risks associated with using those platforms. There are multiple platforms out there, including some which are free. At this point, you really need something easily usable and accessible to you. Comparisons are available on various sites and crowdsourcing feedback from colleagues on the AAP listservs, such as the section on telehealth and SOPAM may be helpful. Most platforms work best from a physician standpoint on a computer with a webcam and microphone. Patients, depending on the platform you choose, need either a smartphone or a computer with a webcam and microphone. Both pediatrician and family need good connectivity for a high quality experience, which is either a reliable Wi-Fi connection where your bandwidth is not being consumed by someone streaming movies or a 4G and, or 5G network. Some platforms work on specific browsers, which you, you will want to identify, and some have browser only or app only, which you will also want to identify. So how do I get prepared? Ideally, you wanna choose one clinical and one non-clinical lead. People who are not averse to trying new things, are patient with others who are struggling, and are problem solvers who can think outside the box. Next, choose a platform. And this can change if you go deeper into your telehealth experience and your needs aren't met with your first one. But when you get a platform, work to understand how it does work best, including specific browsers and other limitations of the platform. Make sure you have the right hardware and know how to enable it. Some parents will struggle to figure out how to enable their camera access or microphone, and some of your pediatricians will also struggle with the same thing. Very important to practice some test visits. Use your staff and your own children and practice using both web browsers and smartphones to make sure how these experiences will evolve over time. So your workflow is really all centered around how to connect with your families. You may wanna start with scheduled telehealth visits only. In my practice, we started with nurses triaging first and then had some criteria for what would be eligible for a telehealth visit. And the staff booked a telehealth appointment and put it in our 
EHR calendar schedule, which was visible just like an office appointment. It just had a different color, so we knew which were in-person visits and which were telehealth visits. Some practices are having a virtual walk-in telehealth program where families self-identify and show up in the virtual waiting room waiting to be seen until there's a pediatrician available to see them. And some practices are choosing specific hours where this walk-in is available for patients. It's amazing how patient families will be because they are waiting in the comfort of their own home and they can go about their business doing other things if they're waiting for you. Eventually, my practice will end up doing a combination of both scheduled visits and on-demand walk-in hours. It's also important to consider where the provider is located. At the office, maybe mixing in uh, in-person sick with telehealth sick, which is what I did yesterday, or maybe you have some people working from home, perhaps they are the pediatricians who are in a higher risk group, or you're just trying to minimize the number of people in the office to reduce everyone's exposure. So how do you get your feet wet? Start using regular office protocols and looking at your triage protocols and seeing where they can be adapted to lead people towards a virtual telehealth visit. Decide which visits are amenable to a telehealth visit. Schedule those visits with a physician who is open for visits. And then at some point, consider dedicating telehealth hours in the office schedule where you're not being filled with in-person appointments. Initially, we gave ourselves 20 minutes per telehealth appointment so we had time to troubleshoot technology and other issues without feeling the pressure of running behind. But as we've had more practice and more experience, the 20 minutes is not necessary be uh, between appointments. Give yourself plenty of that time to make sure that happens. So let's talk about some low-hanging fruit, which is easy to get your feet wet. Most people can quickly get comfortable with rashes or dermatologic issues and things like conjunctivitis, which have low complexity and generally low risk. Cold symptoms may take, make some a bit nervous, but we will get into that in the next slide. Vomiting and diarrhea is often home care advice, and you can provide that while assessing for dehydration and speaking directly to the caregiver emphasizing what to watch for and how to treat. As this crisis continues, many of our families have heightened anxiety and worried, are worried about things, even though their children may be well. I saw a patient earlier this week whose mother was anxious and concerned that the teen's mole was changing. Normally, she would be distracted by daily life, but in the context of the stressors we are all seeing, her concerns were escalated. The mole was fine, and she was reassured. Mental health visits, especially for follow-up of anxiety or depression, are very amenable to telehealth visits and often can give you insight. Posters on the wall of a teen's bedroom can tell you a lot about how they're doing. We are trained to lay our hands on patients and use all our senses to provide a comprehensive assessment. For cold symptoms, often people get nervous at saying, I want to listen to their chest and look in their ears. In this difficult time, it's important to remember that much of what we do at visits is in person is reassurance. You can tell if this child looks ill. You can tell if this child is working hard to breathe. It may be good enough while not ideal in this current climate. And we may have to get comfortable being a little uncomfortable. Ear pain is more difficult unless your patients have peripheral devices at home, which none of mine do. However, if we are to follow the evidence-based guidelines, even true otitis media often self-resolves without the need for antibiotics. And so reassuring families that their child does not appear ill, is not at high risk, and that it is indeed appropriate to give pain relief and observe for 48 hours is good care. If the child continues to have pain, that may be someone you then bring to your office for an in-person visit, the great thing about doing telehealth in the medical home is that we can turn a virtual visit into an in-person visit where it's appropriate. So how is this different than phone advice? Most importantly, it adds important visual information to the visit. It allows us to determine whether this child needs a higher level of care and where that would be most appropriate. Equally important is that parents want to see our face. 
They want our nonverbal communication and they want to feel reassured that they, we saw what they were concerned about. Instead of just relying on their report to us, we can physically also see the child. In most regions and for most payers, you are likely to get paid more for a telehealth visit than for telephone care. Telephone care traditionally has not been paid, but in the midst of this crisis, even telephone care is starting to be recognized and paid by some insurers. This is especially important for our most vulnerable families who may not have access to the technology or bandwidth to connect to us with both an audio and a visual component. So where might you be headed next? Well, start checking your calendar for forward appointments of patients with scheduled appointments for ADD, anxiety, depression, or other mental health issues and move them to telehealth appointments now. Start virtual walk-in hours and advertise them to your patients. Put them both together for a full service telehealth program in your medical home. Then start recalling your patients with chronic conditions who are due or overdue for follow-up and schedule them as virtual visits. One per practice I know is scheduling all of their patients with asthma to review an action plan so they all feel confident that they have the right meds and the right plan should they have a respiratory illness such as COVID that triggers their asthma. Let's talk about the limitations of virtual visits. First, you need to trust your gut. If this needs a face-to-face -face visit, give guidance to the families on why and where is the most appropriate place. If you can provide this sick visit in your office safely, bring them in. If you are hunkered down for respiratory illnesses and don't have enough PPE, you may do what my practice did this week, which was to see respiratory illnesses in the parking lot or in the cars of patients and families with the provider only in full PPE. What about well visits? Well visits may be difficult, but this is changing. The CPT for well visits includes a comprehensive exam, which is not possible with well visits. However, we need, may need to think outside the box if this pandemic lasts long enough that we have to close our offices for several months. And many of us are trying to accomplish well visits for young children who need vaccines because the last thing we need is a vaccine preventable illness outbreak amidst the COVID pandemic we're experiencing. Remember that sometimes technology fails. Be prepared to drop to a phone call if needed. Some patients may not have the technology access. And if you have too many providers trying to provide telehealth in your office at the same time, you may exceed your internet or Wi-Fi capability, which degrades quality, and you may want to send some people home. Families are patient and tolerant of troubleshooting and mistakes in this time of crisis. Let's talk documentation because at some point others may want to review your records. Ideally, a written separate consent to treat precedes the telehealth visit. Some telehealth platforms have that piece integrated into their workflow. At the very least, get verbal consent and document it, whether you're doing this on a telehealth platform or one of the non-HIPAA compliant platforms, the consent documentation is still important to have in the record. You also need to document in your note both the location of the provider and the location of the patient. And it's always a good idea for medical legal reasons to both acknowledge in your note the limitations of the visit as well as when an in-person visit would be more appropriate. Every day, more payers are getting on board and expanding their telehealth policies to include payment for telehealth services. Some are removing restrictions on the patient location to include the home, and the Academy is advocating that all payers should follow this trend. Most payers want a place of service 02 instead of the usual office visit 11, and most want a 95 modifier, but some allow a the GT modifier and some payers are allowing either of those modifiers on the claim. Most of the payers currently for a true telehealth visitor visit want us to use ENM CPT codes, but remember to be careful of countable exam elements when you choose your ENM level. You can often get to a 99213 via synchronous telehealth visit 
And you can also use complexity of medical, medical decision making or time coding rules, which still apply. And all of those resources are found on the Academy's website resources for coding and payment. Included in the references here are the CMS coding fact sheet, which also discusses uses of the portal messaging codes, which are 99421 through 99423. And it's based on the time spent back and forth with a patient in a portal message. In general, this has, been, has to be an existing patient, and this has to be a patient-initiated concern, not one that you reach proactively out to the patient to discuss. There are separate codes for phone calls performed by physicians and those performed by non-provider healthcare staff. In general, the 98966 code series were intended for other healthcare professionals such as therapists, dietitians, and should not be used for RN triage unless this has been documented by the payer in writing. Historically, provider phone calls have been a non-covered service by many payers or bundled. This is changing in the face of the current COVID outbreak as payers understand that some patients may not be in a position to receive any care if they do not allow telephone care performed by the provider. If you are using the telephone care codes, they may be cost shifted to patient responsibility, but that is also changing. And remember that patients may not be in a good position to pay. And so those considerations should be made by the practice if you're going to charge for phone consultation and phone care. Key elements of coding for phone care includes those delineated, delineated on the slide. The AAP has awesome resources on these codes and I encourage you to review them and share them with your practice. Now we come to what I think is the most important part of this discussion. Families want and need telehealth services. They are forgiving of technical glitches and grateful for the opportunity to connect with you from the comfort of their home. In my office, we send a mass email to all of our active patients and told them what was coming, how to register and to bookmark the platform and where to get updates. Use your practice website and social media to reinforce the message that you have extended your medical home beyond your office walls. We've had colleagues who've done Facebook Live uh, conversations to get out this word to all of their families and think outside the box to make sure the message is heard by all your patients. Your families will be very appreciative of you meeting them where they are to provide the care they need and your business depends on you continuing to provide care. The AP website has great resources on telehealth care. There are additional Academy resources on telehealth support. And I encourage you to join the conversation on the multiple Academy listservs, including the section on telehealth care and the section on administration and practice management, and the section on school health, who are all having robust conversations about how we can meet our families' needs while we are working through this COVID crisis together. For questions related to this presentation or other COVID topics, please email COVID-19 at aap.org. Thank you for your attention. And most importantly, thank you for caring for and caring about the families you serve in your communities. Together, we can get through this COVID crisis.